Okay, welcome to chapter two. Chapter two is all about the structured query language, SQL. By the way, we have another course offered at the university. It's a CIS 4352, which goes into structured query language a little bit further. So this is supposed to be just an overview, trying to get you started. We're not gonna learn all the SQL commands in chapter two, just things for, for reporting data back out of a database, that's it. So learning objectives on page 46, they talk about understanding what an ad hoc query is. You know, you could have a stored query that somebody else wrote for you and all you'd have to do is just click on it or you'd have to write it yourself, which is what we're going to be doing, an ad hoc query. Um, retrieving data from just one table, that's pretty easy. Uh, grouping data together because sometimes you want to like find the average or the sum or some sort of a grouping kind of operation. The use of comparison and logical operators, you know, where first name equals Bob. And then uh, retrieving data from multiple tables, which is something we're not actually going to get to in this one particular video. I've broken chapter two up into chunks because chapter two has got a lot of stuff in it and if you're not used to sql at all i want you to take it nice and slow and easy i mentioned that you might want to consider an extra book uh, this is an sql for dummies book it's a very good book um, don't, again I, like i mentioned before don't don't get turned off by the name it's actually a very good book okay so let's begin so the background business intelligence a lot of companies have lots and lots of data lots of data but they can't do anything with it because they don't have the right kind of skills so business intelligence there are companies out there that just do business intelligence for a living they'll descend upon your organization and tell you what your data says which sounds a little weird to me a canned query a canned query is a query that somebody else has already built uh, and then an ad hoc query is one where you type it out on the command line we're going to be using we're going to be typing it out on the command line for quite some time there is a, a, a GUI based graphical user interface, GUI, a GUI way of producing, but quite frankly, you don't learn much doing it that way. So we're not gonna do it that way. Um, there's one called query by example. And again, those are, those are cool, but not useful for learning things. It, it's useful for getting things done, but not in an education environment. So we're gonna be using structured query language, SQL, to write queries against the database. Okay. So, one of the examples they have in the book is this thing called Cape Cod Outdoor Sports. Da -da. Um, and so it's a, um, a database where they have online transaction processing, which means they can have multiple stores or they can have internet customers in some sort of a mail order scenario where it, it could be a device like a point of sale application or it could be a, a web page or it could be some sort of an application. And they all go to some sort of a database and then it, 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 you know, does its thing. Okay, so all the, all the sales, whether it's at a store or internet or mail order, or whatever, um, all go into the same system. So this is considered an online transaction processing, an OLTP, online transaction processing, which means, you know, your people are entering and querying the data nonstop. Okay, so, a little bit more about business intelligence, BI, and data warehouse. We have a chapter coming up talking about this in a little bit more detail. So this is just to wet your whistle. So the components of a business intelligence. So you have your operational database that you own, and then you maybe have some other internal data. Maybe it's in a spreadsheet or something. And then you have some external data. Maybe you, you hired a company called like Amerisearch and provided you customer information. And then ETL stands for extract, uh, translate, transform, and load. ETL, which means I pull the data. I don't want all the data from my operational database. I, I want to thin it down to, for example, I don't need to know every single transaction for a McDonald's at the counter. I could sum it up by the day, and that would be fine. I don't need that, that granular of detail. So extracting the data means I have less data to, to mess with. And then you have some sort of a database management system where you could tap into other data warehouses. And then you have these business intelligence tools. And mostly the, the BI users 
are not your average run-of-the-mill user. These are probably data analysts or, you know, high people way up in the corporate structure who want to determine, for example, you know, why are the sales of MacRib sandwich not doing well in the southeast? That kind of stuff. So you're doing a lot of what-if drills. Okay, one of the things to think about when you're talking about a data warehouse is if you're extracting all this stuff and putting in some sort of a data warehouse, you typically don't do this on the very same machine as your live database. And the reason is that the you can tune a database server to be very responsive to that online transaction processing thing. So this guy, it's got some specific tuning to make this work really, really well. And it is the exact opposite of the things that need to be done to make this go fast. And so you can't really have both. So practically nobody, unless you just have very little data, nobody does business intelligence on the same server or even on the same machine. You just put it on another machine someplace. Okay. Typically this is historical data, right? You know, you're, when you're doing this type of analysis, like where to, where to put the next McDonald's store, um, you don't need live data. You just, you know, historical data is just fine. And quite frankly, historical data could be read only, right? Because you're not going to be making any changes to it. After you extracted all that sales data, you're not going to be going into those tables and adding rows or deleting rows or changing values, right? So there's some shortcuts you can do in a database if it's read only. And then there's a term called a data mart. And quite frankly, the, the dis distinction between a data mart and a data warehouse is relatively small. Uh, basically what a data mart is, just a very small data warehouse, okay? Like a single vendor you go to and say, hey, you know, I need the data on where school high schools are being built because I want my, my, my new McDonald's to be right across the road from the new high school, but I don't know where those are. So you hire a, a company to find out where all the new, the new uh, high schools are being built. So in this example of Cape Cod, this is what their Cape Cod database kind of sort of looks like. They have a retail order um, and then they have a, every retail order could have multiple order line numbers. In other words, it's sort of like filling out a form. You know how at the top of the form is, you know, um, well, OK, I'm, I'm ordering something from Amazon. So it's got my customer name and my address and, you know, the date and the shipping information, blah, 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 blah. And then I ordered five things on that one order. So five items. So that's what the order item is. The order item is those those line items inside a single order. So a single order can have multiple line items. Okay, good. SKU data is sort of like their inventory. Um, so it contains things like the description and, and things like the unit price and things of that nature. And then the buyer, in this particular case, they have people who are, you know, salesmen kind of thing that are associated with buying the, the product. Okay. And then they have some other tables that are not linked. It is actually kind of unusual to have a table design that, it, that have orphan tables. In this particular case, they're orphaned for a reason because they're historical. This is the historical 2020 version of the catalog. And here's the historical 2021 version of the catalog. And so it kind of makes sense that those aren't live tables. So there's no need to be connected to the live database. Okay, cool. So continuing, the next thing they talk about on page 52, they describe this thing called the relational notation. I mentioned that in the last video where we were talking about Appendix A. This is very important that you understand what text-based relational notation is. All right, one more time. Here we go. I'm going to go to here. Whoop, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to the control, to the notepad. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to... So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, you know, student and student is going to have a student ID and it's going to have a first name. And it's going to have a last name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so this, if I do this in underline, which I, I, I can't do that in notepad, I probably should have done this in WordPad or something. I'm going to fake it and make it look kind of funky here. But. So that pretend like that's underlined. OK. So underline means that's the primary key. So this is text-based relational notation. Okay, it's kind of important that you understand what this is. All right, there's an example on page 52. It consists of the table name and then parentheses. And inside the parentheses is a list of column names. A column name could be underlined if it's a primary key 
or italics is the foreign key, or both, because they could be both. Okay. So yes, you're absolutely positively going to have to learn this. Okay. Now there's an odd thing about when you talk about a foreign key. Um, if if I have a foreign key, uh, there's we we call it a foreign key, right? But the thing that attaches to the other the other side of the foreign key doesn't have a name. You know, I, I would have called it I don't know a foreign key receptor or something. I don't know. But there's no name for the other half of the foreign key. Okay. So on page uh, 54, let's talk, start talking about the schema. Schema is a, t a term used in database in lots of different contexts. So it's a little confusing because Oracle's use of schema, the word schema is different than a lot of others. So if you're used to Oracle, schema in the Oracle world is sort of like your user profile. Okay, it has not, not that much to do with your database. But what, what this is, if you had a list of these things, okay, these things, a whole bunch of these guys, that would basically be a, a collection of all of the tables, relational notations. That would be the schema. So if, you, if I gave somebody this, they could look at it and go, oh, okay, I see you've got five tables and here's how they connect and here's where all the primary keys are. It's a way of describing the tables. Okay, good. So we talked about the relational database design. One of the question, one of the examples we had in a previous was an example where they had a choice between having one big table or two smaller tables. You guys remember that? Okay. And I could probably find that really quick. Here we go. I have one big table or two smaller tables. Okay. So the relational design is to use this technique over here where we actually have two tables. Okay. So how do you determine how, how do you split up a table? Okay. I got one big table and how do I split it up into two? Well, the technique is called normalization and we're going to, we're going to talk about this all the time in chapter three. So right now we're just going to broad brush tell you what it is. The technique from getting from the left hand side to the right hand side is normalization, but we'll learn more about that. And so then how do you stitch the tables together? Once I got these two tables, how do I return back to what I had before? And so that's a thing called joining. And we're going to be getting that in, in chapter two, but not the first half of the video. Okay. So on page 55, they start talking about the background behind, behind the SQL language. Okay. So, you know, a lot of people like standardization, you know, like a standard procedure for doing something. So there are st standard committees that meet and vote and say, this is by God, what, what SQL, you know, from clause should look like. And here's what a select clause should look like. And they're very picky and make sure everyone has the right thing. The problem is when databases were first built, like in the, mostly in the US, they use the ANSI character set. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Basically it just means the US character set. And then when we took it over overseas, you know, to other languages, it didn't work well. And so one of the things we did is we changed it to an ISO standard, which is an international standard. Okay, that's better. And then the standards body would actually verify that the vendors were actually telling the truth. They, if they said, well, we, you know, we adhere to standard number, you know, one, two, three, four, they would verify. And then after 1996, they basically said, ah, uh, you guys just do your own self-certification. Really? So now a company can claim to be, uh, you know, compliant with what, you know, I'm compliant with SQL, you know, 2011 standard. And we just have to kind of sort of take their word for it because there's no, there's no formal procedure for determining whether or not they're lying. Okay. Kind of crazy. And the standard was huge. And so they started breaking it up into smaller chunks so they could, they could took too long to get the, the, the changes out. So they broke up one well, tiny little piece over here so they could get it out quickly. And another piece over here they need to be working on. Okay. So we're coming up on the 15 minute mark. So you guys know how this works. <clears throat>